This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. Good afternoon. This is Live and Learn on the Bigger Picture, and I'm Juliet Jacobs. It's Friday, so it's time for our Feminist Friday series, and it's also the eve of Earth Day today. And when it comes to putting a gendered lens on climate change and environmental issues, one school of thought often comes to mind ecofeminism. So ecological feminism or ecofeminism examines the connections between women and nature and relates environmental damage to women's exploitation and lack of empowerment. Joining me now to discuss this in greater detail is Dr. Sharon Bong. She's an associate professor in gender and religious studies. Welcome, Sharon. How are you today? Thank you, Juliet. I'm very well, thanks. Thanks again for coming in. You were our very first guest uh, all these 11 weeks ago, and here you are again. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. No, it was a pleasure. It's my pleasure. So just getting straight into it, you know, the core idea of ecofeminism, I, I believe from what of all I've read, is that feminist and ecological struggles are inherently linked to each other. Is this accurate? Yeah, definitely. It's spot on. Um, ecofeminism is a shorthand for ecological feminism, and um, it's the intersection of um, caring for the environment and uh, caring for women and uh, more broadly for, uh, you know, gender justice. So it's um, fusing, it's the bringing together of um, climate justice Mm -hmm. as well as gender justice. Could you give me a brief historical overview of ecofeminism? You know, how it first came about, you know, what are the movement's uh, origins? Okay, I'll try. Um, This is the history lesson part. (laughs) Okay. Um, for instance, an uh, uh, introduction to gender studies um, textbook that I use um, for one of my first year um, gender studies units um, at Monash traces ecofeminism back to the um, 1970s. So a term first used by a French ecofeminist um, philosopher. But I would hesitate to you know, mark that particular timeline as when it was first circulating in terms of popular or academic discourses because the uh, practice of uh, foregrounding women's care for the environment or women's affinity, special relationship with the environment dates back um, far beyond that, yes. But it uh, grew in the uh, past millennia and within uh, much of Asian contexts, even Af- African contexts, um, practices of um, what you know Westerners frame as ecofeminism had really been practiced as a part of um, culture, yeah, ecosystems, you know, and even indigenous spiritualities may be said to um, embrace elements of ecofeminism. Does ecofeminism claim a single theoretical position and practice, or is there, I mean, do you think there's a unique ecofeminism, or on the contrary, should we speak of ecofeminisms? Mm. I think right now, um, at this stage in the um, new millennium, looking back retrospectively, Clearly, there are ecofeminisms, as there are 11 weeks ago when we talked about feminisms, <laughs> not a single uh, monolithic you know, brand or school of uh, feminist thought, and uh, similarly with ecofeminism. But the heart at the heart of um, ecofeminism, which you know, feminisms, ecofeminisms share, is um, this affinity between uh, women, women as closer to nature, and of course, then the antithesis to that would be that men, you know, um, are pretty much in most social cultural contexts the drivers of development mm-hmm. and progress in a particular kind of narrow way, according to ecofeminists. So, in that sense, we women are seen as the nurturers mm-hmm. of of the environment, and men are seen as the destructive forces causing. I mean, the reason for destruction. It is true, and um, that's one of the. Uh, first critiques of um, (laughs) ecofeminists and that is you know that it plays up what we call essentialisms which means attributing fixed identities or characteristics to women as you know carers as nurturers as protectors because of their life-giving capacity essentially okay so they're seen as you know more aligned with the earth and uh, there are beautiful images um, free on google that you know, would depict the earth as a woman's body. So, you know, rape of the earth, rape of women were seen as synonymous. And unfortunately, working within the economy of such dualisms or binarisms, men are then um, projected as embodying um, all sorts of forces that destroy um, the environment because often the trade-off to development seen in, you know, very narrow sense Uh, would be ecological destruction. Mm -hmm. And that is actually a fact. I mean, not that men are solely to blame, (laughs) but that, 
you know, a very narrow sense of development, an unsustainable one meaning, does result in ecological destruction. So what then is the ecofeminist perception of the ideal society? And I suppose, what, what are ecofeminist theories, what are they trying to achieve? Mm. Uh, that's a good question. Basically, it's uh, quite contemporary. Um, today, there are many people who talk about sustainable development goals. There are all 17 of them. Yep. And you will find that, for instance, goal number five is on gender equality. So today, and goal number one is, you know, no poverty. So um, UN and UN agencies have been going on about this um, because I think the eradication of poverty um, will always be a lifelong aspiration of so many people, not just the ones working on the environment. But uh, more and more people realize, you know, more and more stakeholders realize that um, when you talk about care of the earth, when you talk about clean water, um, safe environments, you know, safe cities, for instance, and also that the uh, flora and fauna are protected, that um, within all of the ecosystem are human beings, which are part of the ecosystem, and so harmful uh, relations, which means gender inequality or inequities, you know, between men and men, men and women, women and women, and then you have all the uh, other characteristics of um, class and ethnic religious affiliations come in. That you know, harmful human relations are also costly to care of the earth. So all of these goals are intertwined, and um, it's multidimensional in that sense: um, care for the environment and care of you know one human. To another, and I suppose then, what do they hope will happen from you know all of these theories? What what changes is it? Are they looking for changes in the way we approach, I suppose, the environment? Or yes, definitely, um, because there are greater number of proponents caring for the environment that you know go about their business in terms of policies and approaches and practices in a very gender neutral um, or gender blind way. Uh, not realizing that, for instance, poverty or ecological destruction or even natural disasters, you know, impact men and women in a different way and disproportionately. So it has um, a very lasting impact on meaningful and long-term policy changes that if you disregard the gender differences or the gender impact of um, the issues that I mentioned, which includes natural disasters and the ones that are, you know, human-driven, like um, ethnic conflicts and all that. Because when you have the combination of ethnic conflicts um, on top of um, ecological disasters, like famine, for instance, and the widespread of diseases that follow from that, like malnutrition, then it's just going to, you know, aggravate the situation. So if people are, are very poor to begin with and life is just not um, sustainable in an abundant sense, then, you know, um, all of these are just going to make that worse. So I suppose if you could give us an example of, an actual example of how that works out, you know, because um, saying that environmental degradation affects men and women differently, I mean, what sort of example would you give? Mm. Um, so, for instance, if you're looking at relatively, you know, poor community, um, let's say um, a farming community, and um, there is ethnic conflict in that community, but to begin with, um, because they live very hard lives, so they are farmers, but, you know, maybe the land is arid, okay, in parts of Africa, for instance, or Asia. And then on top of that, you have um, ethnic conflict. So in a situation like this, um, sexual reproductive health and rights will be the first to suffer for both women and men. Mm -hmm. And of course, the older women and men and the children, boys and girls, will suffer more. But... If there are, for instance, um, gang rapes or gender and sexual-based violence that come with, you know, militia coming into these villages um, and, you know, taking away remaining livestock and taking away lives or, you know, gang raping women and, and children or boys, then it may be said that in situations like this, um, girls and women as opposed to boys and men, you know, will suffer the collective effects in a different way and also in a rather disproportionate way. So essentially what they're saying then that I'm guessing that policy needs to take into account 
these sorts of things. That gender is definitely an issue. It's not just a, a blanket statement that can be made, a blanket policy yeah, that can be made definitely. for both genders. Gender approaches are really, really important in terms of um, engendering policies that work, you know, or gender frameworks that need to be applied. So when you're helping a society heal, when you're trying to reconstruct or rebuild a society after, you know, either ecological destruction or the kind that's brought about by um, human-made, you know, wars and ethnic conflicts, then um, a gendered approach is really important. Okay, so it, it does, would you say ecofeminism plays an important role in like political ecology, for example? Yes, definitely. I mean, now, you know, nowadays, um, ecofeminism may not be um, a term that people easily recognize, for instance. So I'm rather pleased that you've given this platform, um, you know, to give that more visibility. Uh, I'm certainly very much attracted to um, the term and still am. But um, not many people would recognize that what they do is uh, necessarily framed within, you know, feminist e ecology, as it were. I'm speaking today to Dr. Sharon Bong. She's an associate professor in gender and religious studies, and we are discussing ecofeminism today on the uh, eve of Earth Day. And coming up after the break, we find out what exactly um, Dr. Sharon was so interested in ecofeminism about. We'll continue after this quick break. You are listening to Live and Learn on the Bigger Picture, BFM 89.9. Good afternoon. This is Live and Learn on the Bigger Picture, and I'm Juliet Jacobs. It's Feminist Fridays, and today we are talking about ecofeminism. And joining me in the studio is Dr. Sharon Bong. She is an associate professor in gender and religious studies. Sharon, I guess maybe before we continue, what actually drew you to ecofeminism personally? You know, why did it appeal to you so much? Um, good question. The person is always political in that sense. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's the intersection. You know, the intersection between care of the environment and privileging women's care um, for the environment. Uh, that really appeals to me because um, so very often, you know, women's struggles and women's voices and their narratives get lost or devalued or trivialized. Yes. And we were talking how um, policies can affect women and should, I mean, they do affect men and women differently. And uh, we were talking about things that like somehow men are blamed for environmental degradation because women are seen as the nurturers and the, the ones who are caring for the earth. But ecofeminism also points out that uh, women's unique involvement in environmental damage, that beyond, you know, beyond the theoretical stuff, the interaction that women, particularly in developing countries, for example, have with environmental degradation, because I suppose they are actually working the land and causing degradation in that sense. I mean, is, is this something that is quite commonly known within uh, ecofeminism? Maybe just to qualify that a little, I think it's the same sort of um, accusations that indigenous peoples get as well, you mm -hmm. know, um, slashing and burning. But um, you would find that why Why would ecofeminist stalwarts like Vandana Shiva, for instance, and there are many like her. So when you read the work of ecofeminists, at least the first wave of ecofeminists, um, it's quite polemical. The language is quite strong. So, for instance, men would, you know, um, be quite quite um, explicitly blamed for mal development, M-A-L. So it's kind of sickness, a kind of development that brings about sickness of the land and, you know, a fracturing of human uh, relationships, for instance. Mm, so that bit about, you know, blaming women um, because they are the ones tilling the land, um, a lot of that changed, firstly, in Western societies with the um, tractors and other technological advances. So then, you know, men literally became the drivers because right. they started to take over handling the machines. And so women were relegated back into the domestic or home front, you know, preparing the food and not just like going out to, to gather and... And when women and indigenous peoples, for instance, do it, um, they do it in a way that still uh, maintains a certain equilibrium with the environment. So it's not a case of, you know, either one reaping more than you actually would need. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, point of contention here is the degree in which um, s the development, you know, tips from being sustainable to not sustainable. And at the rate that we have been um, progressing and because men hold the seat of um, so many, you know, um, drivers of um, progress, whether it's economic, political and so on and so forth. So that is why even till today, it is still quite true. It's, it does not ring hollow, but, you know, it's quite true that because it's still a very male dominated um, world, as it were. So progress is still driven by men, but... Um, 
The problem is now where, you know, the uh, control over um, these tools can wield so much more greater and faster damage on the environment. So women are really um, the lesser players um, in this, you know. So they're vulnerable to it as well. Yeah, they have been from the start, but now the vulnerability is um, even more exacerbated. Do you, do you think that it's possible actually to build a society where equality and sustainability are actually prioritized? Yes. I mean, that that's, that's a long-standing aspiration, personal aspiration of mine. <laughs> and um, it's not just eco-feminists who have this vision. There are other feminists and there are others who, as we spoke 11 weeks ago, uh, who may not identify as being feminists, but, you know, if they are rooting for um, gender equality and gender equity, um, trying to, um, you know, create enabling environments where men and women from different ethnicities, age and classes have more or less equal access to resources. And that's at the heart of this, the um, inequitable, you know, access to resources across human societies. That's really at the heart of this ecofeminism. And are there also very lively debates, you know, between ecofeminists about what, what ecofeminism should be about? Yeah, definitely. Um, I alluded to what I see as the first wave of ecofeminism, and that is very, you know, polemical um, drawing out of uh, these hard boundaries between, you know, women as um, carers of the uh, nurturers and protectors of the environment, and then the poor men, you know, as the villains in this in this play. <laughs> but um, with the first uh, round of critique by feminists leveled at ecofeminists. So the language and the uh, standpoint, you know, the, the particular political and uh, moral and theoretical um, positioning has been uh, more nuanced now. So um, there are, you know, other forms of feminisms that have taken been taken up. And uh, when I first came across ecofeminism, it was in the context of a spiritual sense. You see, so care of the environment um, can be spiritualized because when you look to see who, you know, um, the spirit of creation is in across many cultures and spiritualities, um, that principle of creation is feminine, yeah. is feminized, you know, the feminine spirit of uh, creation. So you would have as a flow out from that, for instance, queer ecofeminism, where they look not just at the care of the environment or climate justice, but also gender diversity. So they looked at biodiversity, mm -hmm. you know, the parallelism between biodiversity, for instance, and gender diversity. So okay. these are more current trends that flow out of ecofeminism. I mean, just mentioning it, you're talking about how uh, it's always alluded to, to being very feminine, you know, to care yeah. for the just Mother Nature, the word itself. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, where did that come from? I mean, exactly. it's the fecundity, it's those sorts of things, right? Definitely, definitely. So it's not an accident. The very ontological reality of being a woman is that she is life-giving. Yeah. So that's why um, the eco-feminists were heavily criticized initially for being too essentializing because, you know, they just sort of like zoomed in on this one capacity of woman. And uh, of course, it's a problem <laughs> if you see that, you know, women only should be valued for their life-giving capacity, which, of course, is not true. Women are valued today for so many other gifts and talents. But this was the one, you know, problem that feminists had of ecofeminists. So the dichotomy between spiritual ecofeminism and economic uh, feminism. Yes, that, and but um, at the heart of it, you know, essentializing women as um, having this fixed attribute of um, being carers mm -hmm. or being nurturers, yeah. Okay. And what, where do you stand on the topic? On the topic of ecofeminism? Ecofeminism, sorry, um, of um, the dichotomy between material and spiritual uh, ecofeminism. Mm. Well, I, I think... The historically and, and you know, um, intellectually, I think there is um, a reason, a rhyme and a reason why um, at different phases there are different aspects of what it means to be um, our gendered selves or sexual selves and care of the environment. And so the position that ecofeminists took um, at the turn of the century was an important one because back then you could see um, at the rate that we were developing and that, you know, all the various um, indicators of progress that the ecological um, destruction that we are now experiencing can only get from bad to worse. So, uh, you know, people in the different languages and different approaches try to garner support to halt the, the um, juggernaut of uh, progress, if you will, 
And so the position that ecofeminists take is that, you know, let's, let's just pause for a while, let's just reclaim, you know, women's role, women's contribution in all of this, even in urban settings now, and uh, let's just value, you know, um, the sort of uh, work that women put into feeding their families, caring for the environment, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's both um, an appreciation for both the material and the spiritual. It's not the disregard of one, you know, at, ex- at the expense of the other. Yeah, so it's not essentialist as, as yeah. such. Yeah. Okay. And what are some of the main challenges that ecofeminism actually faces today, especially now in the 21st century, I would say? That uh, people don't immediately see the connection between climate justice and gender justice, for instance, you know, where... Um, there are still um, there's still a lack of appreciation as to uh, how very real um, this reality is that uh, women and men in many many social cultural political contexts have a different access differentiated access to resources, yep. whether the resources are natural ones or whether they are you know the ones that you accrue um, wages and so on and so forth so I think that is the biggest struggle, um, and even I, I experienced that in the classroom as well, trying to get this one um, main takeaway you know, home, and that is there is um, an amazing synergy uh, between you know, climate justice and gender justice that one is um, you can't do without, uh, with one. You can't do away with either one. Yeah. So I suppose what 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 does it take then to be an ecofeminist in this in our current day you know in the in the twenty first century? I think there are certain spiritualities who have it right, um, Buddhism in particular, because it you know appreciates how um, one must have um, respect for all sentient beings. So even a rock, for instance, like indigenous peoples' uh, spiritualities, you know, see that a rock is not just like to most people, just, you know, a rock. Mm -hmm. It is invested with life. So I think in a very basic way, if each of us could actually see um, how, you know, as human beings, although we may be given the privilege to lord it over other creations, okay, and Christianity and and Islam are particularly... um, Uh, responsible for this, if you like. But to me, um, the Buddhist framework, you know, um, I think they have it more right in a sense that they see the um, individual or the human not as the center of the universe and center of creation, but as one of um, other members of creation or other units or other aspects of creation and not just the environment, but creation. And I think if individually we can see that uh, we are one among many and others, then it is humbling. Mm-hmm. And what would potentially flow out of that would be, you know, uh, respect for the integrity of um, all of these, you know, unique and special parts of creation and how we move forward and get on with our lives, you know, without fracturing um, this whole web of um, relationships. And I think... Ecofeminism is pretty well known uh, in the in Europe and the US, for example. But does it quite have a follow? I mean, you spoke about Buddhism, but I mean, does ecofeminism actually have a following here in Asia, as far as you know? As I mentioned earlier in the interview, even if you know Asian spiritualities or peoples may not necessarily recognize ecofeminism as a label, yeah. um, but by <laughs> virtue of their way of being in the world of existing, you know, with and in the world, um, they are already, to all intents and purposes, practicing um, an eco-feminist um, approach to, you know, um, the environment and uh, to creation, rather. And the special feature in an Asian context is the spirituality that frames care of, you know, the creation. Yeah. And I think when I was reading one name, a very Asian name kept popping out and you mentioned her earlier as well, Vandana Shiva. Mm. And she's, I think, uh, well, in the reading that I did, she's considered one of the first people to really talk about it and she wrote a book about it. Maybe you could tell me a bit more about her just to give some context into, Mm. you know, the Asian read, I suppose, on ecofeminism. Her seminal book is um, Staying Alive and I think that was published in the 1980s. And if you read that, um, you'll find that, yes, okay, so, you know, you have one of the earlier chapters talk about moral development and the men are blamed. But the strength of and the unique um, aspect of Vandana Shiva staying alive is 
uh, linked to the last point that I made, and that is um, drawing from um, Hindu Hindu uh, mythologies, you know, on the whole uh, feminine spirit of um, principle of creation. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I think fun fact to know about her, tree hugger actually was coined uh, after Shiva and other activists hugged trees to oppose commercial logging in India back in the 70s. That was, uh, you know, we all think of tree hugger as something that's uh, it's a funny term that we just call environmentalist, right? But it actually was born from a very real struggle. Of course, of course. And yeah. then the Chipko movement as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it took tremendous um, courage um, by predominantly women, you know, because you have the men uh, with the machines ready to cut down the trees. And uh, what women are basically saying is quite literally over my dead body because when they hug the tree, okay, and, you know, the, the beautiful thing, if you can imagine it, the circumference of the tree, you know, is as, as uh, probably bigger than, than, you know, the encircling of, of their arms and the women so totally identifying with... Um, this particular one element of nature that they're willing to give up their lives Thank for us. what many would consider why bother, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I just wanted to ask your opinion on how you think ecofeminist theories can enrich other contemporary activist movements. It's a humbling, it's a humbling reminder that as human beings, we are one of um, other members of uh, creation and other parts of creation because so much of the time, um, in many, many activist struggles, um, the activists for the environment would be an exception, but in other kinds of struggles uh, for children's rights, women's rights, for instance, uh, sometimes we forget, you know, that um, there are greater forces beyond what already are very heavy and often very crippling uh, problems and issues that one has to deal with. And so when you take a step back and you start to appreciate that the uh, human, um, whilst we are lauded as the uh, center of the uh, universe and, you know, the Earth's resources are ours for the taking, yeah. that um, a more humble approach would, you know, better lead to, I think, a more egalitarian approach, not just in terms of um, human relationships, but also in relation to um, the Earth and creation, yeah. So just to conclude, um, what I suppose would be your message to anyone, you know, about why ecofeminism should be something that we adopt, that's something that we should, you know, live by, I suppose. Why would I um, <laughs> give that message? Because I think it is holistic. And uh, I mentioned the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, just a while ago. Um, it presents today, uh, you know, the most holistic Um, sense of uh, not just human development, but um, care for creation. And it is um, very egoistical. And I don't think we can afford to, you know, continue being so uh, egoistical as human beings to think that um, the earth is really at the mercy of, you know, our well-being alone. So I think that is something to be treasured about, um, um, a message that, you know, feminists from a very, very long time ago were going on about and that, you know, it still has very contemporary, I think, currency today. And uh, sorry, one final question, because since you're a lecturer, <laughs> what is some essential reading for the topic, maybe for anyone who is interested? Uh, without question, Vadan Shiva is um, staying alive. And there are also um, other books on um, um, ecofeminism. There is one by Warren, for instance. Um, I think her name is first name is Karen um, on ecofeminisms, and it's a reader. So it's um, always uh, convenient when you have a good reader, and you can you know see various various um, dimensions uh, bringing in together science and um, um, philosophy, for instance, and you know care for children, care for the environment and so on and so forth, yeah. And are there also any other examples of ecofeminism, I suppose found in like popular culture, something that you and I might have seen on TV, for example? Yeah, definitely. I was just so excited. Have you watched Moana? Yes, I have. Yeah, okay, the Walt Disney animation. I remember that when I watched it um, just a few weeks ago, I was really, really struck by um, what I read or interpreted as um, an ecofeminist message. Uh, because if you recall... 
so many of the islands um, in the Pacific, the Pacific Islands, um, started to slowly wither and die and became more arid, and so you know not sustainable for uh, vegetation. And of course, the villagers, the f- the the um, fisher folk who live, you know, in those villages, including Moana's family, eventually towards the end of the uh, animation, uh, were also suffering. Yeah. And the uh, climax, so let's not spoil it for, you know, um, the uh, (laughs) listening audience. Yeah. Um, The climax uh, really cements it all together. I mean, for me, in terms of an eco-feminist reading, because um, when the, uh, you know, sort of like life-giving heart of um, Mother Earth or the Earth Goddess was taken or rather stolen, that's something comparable to uh, rape of the earth, you know, rape of the woman, because there was literally an oversized um, sort of woman. The earth was almost shaped like a woman who was, uh, you know, at rest. She looked at rest, but she was actually dying. Um, And when that heart was returned at the end, then um, it's one of those happily ever after um, endings where uh, nature started to blossom and the flowers, you know, were out and, uh, yeah, so when, when her life was given back to her, she started to then reciprocate by giving life back to, um, you know, the islands and the islanders and so on and so forth, yeah. So how exactly does that tie in with ecofeminism? I mean, what is the exact point that, you're, that, that connects them? Um, I guess because the um, uh, island itself, you know, was shaped as a woman, as a woman, and of course, as one of the princess movies as well, that the uh, heroine is um, a um, Pacific princess, you know, Moana herself. But um, the message of ecofeminism, firstly, lies in the symbolism of um, Earth as a goddess, mm-hmm. as a mother who looks after and who looks out for. And um, secondly, you know, that the uh, rape of the Earth is akin to rape of the woman as such. So when you take away what is not yours or where you take away and that brings destruction to um, so many others, you know, the person who did it was not fully reflective of um, the far-reaching consequences of his act, which is an act of vanity, right, to increase his sense of uh, superpowerness <laughs> uh, and masculinity. Um, so again, playing on this, um, you know, dualism of the uh, woman as the um, the environment or nurturer of the environment, and the uh, man figure, you know, as the one who uh, fractures that relationship, and then um, finally um, reinstating all of that, you know, by giving back to um, Mother Nature what was hers to begin with, mm-hmm. and not forcibly taken, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Sharon. Welcome. I've been speaking to Dr. Sharon Bong. She's an Associate Professor in Gender and Religious Studies, and we were discussing ecofeminism. You've been listening to Feminist Fridays on Live and Learn. This is The Bigger Picture, BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.